Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our VAO Insider Webinar on Virtual Army Acquisition Collaboration with Matthew Miner. Today we'll be talking with Matt about the Army's innovations in acquisition training and in getting program and procurement staffers working more collaborative from the requirements generation phase right through the entire acquisition lifecycle by enabling everybody to track procurements virtually using the same database. I'm Ann Laurent and I'll be your moderator today. I'm the Director of Strategic Initiatives here at ASI. Some of you may also have known me during my years of editing and writing and researching at Government Executive Magazine and Federal Times Newspaper, Bloomberg Government, and the Partnership for Public Service, which is, in short, to say I've been around for a while, and I'm sure that I've run into some of you in my long journey. Also joining us today will be Melissa Martin. She's our Director of Training and Products here at ASI. Melissa will be running today's webinar behind the scenes and helping you with any technical problems, also letting you know how to get your CLPs. Uh, well, actually, no, Shana Blaney is going to let you know how to get your CLPs today at the end of the presentation. Uh, I see that we've got folks from Army, Navy, GSA, the Defense Contracts Management Agency, and others uh, with us today, uh, most of you being, I think, in the contracting field, either contracting officers or contracting specialists, but we also have some program managers aboard and others. So I want to welcome each and every one of you. I will promise that we're going to try to address as many of your varied interests as we can. I hope you all enjoyed uh, the avatar training video that we sent out a uh, link to in our invitations. If you missed it, uh, don't worry, we're going to try to fit clip in uh, later in the presentation today. So right now you should see today's presentation slides, slides on the left of your screen and a Q&A box to the right. You also should have received an emailed copy of the slides this morning and links to those avatar videos I was talking about. Um, there's also a link to the slides on the VAO homepage too. Uh, we're going to try to uh, address as many of your questions as possible as we go throughout today's presentation. So that means you can't hold on to your questions until the end. We need you to type them in the Q&A box that you see on your screen as they occur to you and hit send, and then I'll try to weave them in as Matt and I proceed in our discussion. If you stump Matt with a question, we'll follow up in writing after researching it, and you'll be getting a document with all the questions and answers soon after the webinar. So now I'm going to welcome Matt, and he's going to give uh, about a 16-slide presentation. I'll ask your questions as we go, along with a few of my own. So without further ado, I want to introduce Matthew Miner. He's managed the Army Contracting Command's Virtual Contract Enterprise Office, or VCE, since 2009. He also has true acquisition professional chops. He joined the government in 1984 as an Army Material Command 1102 contracting intern, and he's spent 21 years as an Army contract specialist and a contracting officer. He's going to tell us how VCE is working to create one version of truth for program and procurement personnel, creating a database and dashboards so everyone involved can monitor what's important to them within an ongoing acquisition. That includes acquisition professionals, program executive officers, heads of contracting activities, the Army Contracting Command, all the way up to the Army Deputy Assistant Secretary for Acquisition, Harry Halleck, and the leaders of major commands. So one version of truth for everybody. It's, uh, I think it's a fairly revolutionary uh, attainment for them, and I want to, I want to be sure that, that you can uh, get a chance to see it with Matt. And then he's also going to share what's my favorite, the story of the now famous Army Avatar Video Procurement Trainings. He claims the idea was based on a successful virtual classroom uh, program for nursing and hospital staff. Um, I'm not sure. I think that, that probably VCE had the idea first and, and was just uh, letting, the, letting the hospital folks uh, uh, go ahead of them. But in any case, now Army has dozens of videos featuring avatars teaching everything from choosing source selection evaluation factors to developing independent government cost estimates. And Matt tells me that when he and his team see employees uh, on the contracting team struggling with one process or another, or when the Army Procurement Office gets a negative audit finding, the team at VCE builds an avatar video for quick 20, 10 to 20 minute trainings. And that must be working because the Federal Acquisition Institute is now offering the Army avatar videos to the entire Federal Acquisition Corps. 
Matt's got an action-packed presentation, so I'm going to be quiet now and hand it over to him. Uh, thanks, Ann. I'm, I'm looking forward to talking with my fellow COs and acquisition pros here at VAO. I hope they will come away with today's presentation, understanding a little bit how the Army is moving towards transparency, collaboration, uh, using new training concepts like you mentioned, uh, the avatars. Um, with that, I just want to give a quick uh, background overview of what VCE is. Um, about ten years ago, uh, during the war, the highlight of the war, we were, uh, many of you know, we were taking a beating, uh, Army contracting was. So the uh, Army stood up the Gansler Commission and they did a review of Army contracting and came up with a list of findings. And one of the findings was that uh, the contracting community, the 1102 community, did not really have the requisite tools to do their job. Uh, and there was really no oversight as far as metrics and having a standard database where we could track uh, data and really get an oversight into what we're doing. So in response to that, they stood up um, our office. And on this slide, there's a, a list of strategic and tactical objectives that they gave us. And uh, the top one there, transparency and standardization was important. Uh, and train as you fight, fight as you train. Basically, um, provide the leadership and down to the contract specialist and CAO level oversight into what they were doing and the metrics involved with that. But also for the 1102s uh, and our 51 Charlies, our military counterparts that do contracting, when they deploy and they go into theater in a war environment or contingency or expeditionary, that they see the same tools and processes that they would see when they're working in their office here at home. Uh, one of the findings was we a lot of people volunteered to go overseas, uh, Patriots all, but when they got there, uh, there was a whole disparate suite of systems that they had to get trained up on, and that really had an adverse impact on our ability to fight. And so we stood up these tools so if, when you're working here in the States, if you get deployed, uh, you should have the same business processes that you have when you're overseas. This next slide is just a uh, picture of the 10 VC modules. Uh, because of the time constraints, I'm not going to go through all of these, but um, they're basically the, we have a virtual electronic contract folder, which I'm going to show you in a, a screenshot in a second, um, and then business intelligence tools. We have some smart forms, and like Ann mentioned, uh, we call it PT, process training, but basically using social media and avatars, MillTube, uh, Adobe Captivate, uh, to do quick training. The paperless contract file, basically this is our central hub. Uh, this is a paperless contract file. It's virtual. Uh, it is a web-based application for all our pre- and post-award documentation with a workflow. It's sort of like a TurboTax for contracting. Uh, it's web-based. Uh, it gives us the ability to move work around to different geographic locations. Uh, it also helps us with uh, teleworking and records management and responsibilities. And also, if we have uh, a surge, like in one area of the world, we, uh, we, we know that's coming. We can move work to different parts of uh, the Army uh, so we don't have a resource issue. So we, we can pre-position ourselves uh, in advance of an event uh, like we, uh, we couldn't do before and got us in trouble. The key hey, Matt, um, do, do, you, uh, do you know of any other organizations across government that have something similar to this? Not that I'm aware of. Uh, basically, the key about this is with 50, this is DOD 5015 records management certified. So it's, it follows the National Archives Act, which means if you have your contract documents for our for our case in a system like this, you don't need to have a paper copy. And not having you don't have to have to keep a paper copy, but if you have a digital copy, it enables you to move work around electronically. As long as folks have access to the internet, no matter where they're at in the world, you could pick up someone else's work or move their work to that to that location. You mean to tell me that you no longer have some gigantic uh, 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 warehouse with paper contracts in it? We don't have. Uh, we we still have some of those. We're we're getting rid of them. Um, but I will tell you that some of the contract specialist kids will have a working desk copy um, of their file. But the official record. Uh, as far as the GAO or litigation is in PCF. So the, the next slide, uh, this is the file uh, copy of the 
what we talked about, standardization. This is the standard ARMY file index that we have. So if, you're using, if all the user, ARMY users of PCF, if they go deploy, they'll see the same file index. Uh, they'll see their documents. Uh, it gives us a situational awareness. Uh, basically, you know the status of every document, where it's at in the workflow, if it's in legal, if it's in small business, the competition advocate. Um, you can click and drag the documents from your customer. If your customer sends you, they can submit the documents in here, or you, they send it to you email. If you have it on your hard drive, you just click and drag it over and put it in there. Um, again, if there's, again, we've had cases where some offices have too much work, their resources go down, and we just open it up to another office and they can help pick up their work. Um, or we can move work. If work gets moved from one office to another, we just do it virtually and move that work over uh, instead of sending contract files over. It also helps with the GAO um, if we have audits, AAA audits. <clears throat> Basically, they, they're granted access. They can come in so they don't have to visit. Uh, PMR teams, uh, our PMR teams, they can do a virtual PMR review, so that reduces a lot of the travel cost. Uh, but it also gives us in insight uh, into what's really going on in the organization as far as uh, the workload and, uh, and the quality of the work. So, Matt, just for, an, uh, for instance, if I'm a, um, a core and I, and I want to use a contract that another core is the core for, right? Mm -hmm. um, are there ways for us to share information like how much, you know, how many dollars are left on that BPA or whatever uh, through this system as yeah, opposed so to me having to like track you down and figure out what your name is and figure out how to send you an email and you're not there and, you know, the usual runaround that we all go through, uh, particularly in situations like that when we're all, you know, when we're trying to use somebody else's contract. Yeah, we have that, um, and I think I'm going to talk about that in, in about four slides, the business intelligence. Um, it has all that type of reporting. Um, dashboards and we, we can push that data to a customer or they can go in and do an ad hoc report if they have a specific contract and they want to find out who the COR is, who has the contract. Um, and then those reports have links actually take you into the, to the file uh, so you don't have to go search for it. There will be like a blue URL link that will take you to the cabinet that has that documentation. <laughs> this is great stuff. Okay, I'm sorry. I keep on going. So the other thing that we have in the, uh, uh, in the paperless contract file is a procurement management review. Like I mentioned, uh, uh, the policy and the staff can go in and do a, uh, a review uh, virtually. Um, but what it also does, it enables the, uh, the contract specialist or the contract officer to do a PMR self-assessment. And if you look at the next slide that I'm going to show you, um, contract specialists, when they, they could do a putting their pre-award folder together when they're done, they would run this. And it's like um, if folks familiar with TurboTax when, you know, you think you're done your taxes and they ask, do you want to do a federal and state review? Uh, it's very similar to that. So you do a review and it tells you what documents uh, you may be missing uh, from your file. And uh, I got a, for folks that asked, do we have metrics on this? I got a report last night that uh, there was an organization uh, did a PMR and I think 61% of their contracts were missing one or more documents from their files. And by using this tool, that number went down to 10%. Um, so uh, this is an interesting uh, feature for us. Uh, we're just really getting data on this to understand uh, the utility of it, uh, but we're seeing some benefit with that. Especially so now, does the, I, does, the IG, uh, uh, does the IG like that or not like it? Might hurt their workload. The, the PMR teams love it because the deal that they, uh, which I thought was fascinating, was the uh, the people leading the PMR team um, told the parks, the leadership, that if, if you run these tools, run the PMR assessment, and you're green, uh, when we come in and do a formal review, you should be green. You, you should pass. If you run mm -hmm. these on your buys or you do a periodic review of the P, using the PMR tool across your organization, there's nothing really different in this tool that we're not going to review when we do a formal PMR. So if you do that, you should be green. And that was kind of like a, a, a good bargain with the leadership. Um, and so far it seems to be working. We, we seem to be getting the buy-in buy -in on that. That's great. Uh, the next uh, is the business intelligence, kind of what you were talking about, Ann. So all these tools, uh, basically we have um, we gather all the data and we put it in a, a data warehouse. 
um, all the 10 tools. We also get data feeds from about 20 different data sources like FPD, SNG, um, and uh, this allows us to bring disparate data sources together to help us meet our oversight responsibility and metrics uh, reporting and gives us the transparency that, that you mentioned uh, in the intro, uh, which I'm going to show you on this next slide. is just, just a, a sample of one of the, the dashboards. Uh, this one is for the commanding general of Army Contracting Command. Uh, but like you said, we have it going up to the uh, uh, the senior procurement executive in the Army, the Acquis uh, Army acquisition executive, um, our four-star generals, um, our COCOM commanders. Uh, so at this, is, this is a tactical level dashboard. Uh, basically, these are the metrics that the general asks us to put on his dashboard right now. And at the, to the right, the generals are on the far left at the top. Um, all his GOs and senior parks are there to the right. And you just click on their face and it takes you to their organization. Uh, so you can see their specific metrics and drills down to, you know, to the number of actions the contract specialist has, their workload, the type of work that they've done, uh, who the customer is, how many actions we have for each customer. Um, at the top level, it gives, uh, like you said, Mr. Halleck, our senior procurement guy, uh, information across the Army, uh, the type of obligations that we have. Uh, the thing interesting about this is that if we see something that they want to change, uh, if they want to improve something, they'll put the gauge on the dashboard. And that kind of drives everyone to improve performance. Uh, for example, we took a beating on during the war not having CORs assigned to uh, our service contracts. Mm -hmm. So the uh, senior procurement executive put the gauge on her dashboard and the generals put them on theirs. And basically everyone underneath that didn't want to be read. They, I mean, you don't want to go in front of the boss and explain that you're red. And within, a, I think, about six to eight months, we, we were going from red to yellow, and then we went to green. And that, and that was driven in part by the dashboard that uh, it got senior leaders' attention. Um, so there, there's the, the power of transparency is, is, is pretty impressive. And if it's transparent, you really can change behavior. And that's kind of what we were doing uh, with the business intelligence and these and these dashboards. That's really fascinating. So you say you can switch these uh, gauges out. This like this little dial with the needle on it can be you know can be representing any number of different factors. Yes. Uh, in fact, uh, even by organization. Uh, in fact, we have a meeting with uh, the Corps of Engineers on Monday, and they're going to tell us what they would like to see on their dashboards. Uh, the National Guard, uh, I think we're building a few for them. The COCOM commanders, which is kind of a fascinating uh, dashboard, is that uh, uh, we can pull in with NG data the, all the different uh, dollars being spent, like by UIID, uh, State Department, uh, and DOD. Uh, never before our COCOM commander uh, had a complete picture of the total government spend in, in theater. So when he's meeting the the ambassador of the country, he, it really gives them an appreciation for not just what the Army or the DOD is spending in that country, uh, but what the entire United States is, is putting into that country with our different agencies. Uh, so I'm not going to say it gives them some leverage in discussions, but it really helps them understand the total common operating environment in, in, in his uh, uh, sphere of influence. That's just amazing. That is terrific. So you can actually, how do you get the, you just pull it out from FPDS then to get the State Department uh, dollars as well? Yeah, yeah that's one of them. Uh, we also do uh, uh, CAPMIS for training so we can match up, like we have a, a KO warrant tool for their warrants. We can, met, you know, their, their CLP points. Uh, we can see, uh, like here's a sample we, of, our, of a customer screen. Uh, basically how many actions we have for each customer, um, whether it's a reimbursable, uh, the funding type, uh, are we giving the specialists too much work? Uh, we, you know, there's been, I'm sure everybody here on knows that uh, some of the KOs have, you know, on average 50, 60 actions and the, the another KO or specialist may only have two or three, you know, mm -hmm. so we're trying to figure out, you know, what's going on there, uh, try to balance the workload. Um, and also what it also does is it helps us with the fight for resources. Um, a lot of folks uh, come to, to, the, to the Army uh, trying to peel back 1102s, and this, for the first time, we have a, 
enough data now to make a case why we need resources. Uh, when the Gansler Commission was finished, we, we, got, we struggled. You know, why do we need 2,000 more 1102s? Why do we need more contracting officers? We really didn't have a database. Uh, now we can show uh, how many actions uh, we do annually, uh, what's the average for specialists, but more importantly, which I think everyone on the phone knows, uh, it's not just the new work that we do each year, the, the, the actual obligations. Uh, that seems to always be the primary focus. It, it's all the contract admin that we're responsible for. We have over $150 billion of open contracts. Uh, so it enables us to say, look, it's not just the new work that we did this fiscal year, what we did in f fiscal year FY16, but it's what we've done in open. This is the workflow. And right now, it's, if you look at it, it's humanly impossible for any group of people you know, that's small to manage that entire workload. So we, we can make a case. And, and that's the, uh, another beauty of, of having this information in a warehouse that you can present and a dashboard to senior leadership so they know, because these three stars, four stars, and the secretary, they're in those discussions uh, daily about resources. So they have the information at their hand. Now, when you um, say that there's this uh, big load that's not represented by new actions. Where do you show that on these dashboards? Uh, so we have it in uh, uh, business intelligence reports. So we, we have the, uh, the workload, our open contract listing. We have I it see. down by each site, each DODAC, and then we have an average of what the workload is for each contract specialist and each KO. Uh, we pull metrics on that. It's just not on this. This is just a sample report that's in front of you right now. Mm -hmm. um, this is a report that we show our customers. Uh, they can see how many contract specialists are supporting their office. Um, so it, it gives the leadership an idea that, hey, are we putting too much work in one office or does one, is one office have capacity? Uh, so it enables us to, to have a picture of that and easily move work around if we, if we need to do that. So that means you also know uh, or, or can, can represent inside this system uh, who's working where across the, the contracting workforce then, too? Yes. Yes. And it's, that's pretty revolutionary, I would think. I'm, I'm not sure that I've ever heard of any organization that could do that this way on, on screen, you know, in real time. So, so the next... Folks who are, just uh, one second, Matt. For folks who are listening, uh, I don't want to be the only one asking questions because I am positive that I'm not going to ask your most important burning issues. So please get those questions up there on the, uh, the Q&A box so that we can work them in as we go. Go ahead, Matt. I'm sorry to interrupt. So the, the next thing that we've been working with is um, Adobe Lifecycle Smart Forms. This is a technology that Amazon is using, uh, Adobe Experience Manager. Those, I'm sure everyone here has used Amazon, so as you know, when you're buying something or you're looking at something, uh, they have a unique way of, uh, hey, uh, based on what you're looking at, you might be interested in this as well. Um, and they use some form technology. Um, so uh, the, uh, the Army and then the DOD uh, bought an enterprise license, and uh, we've been jumping on that. We've done about uh, 30 forms, and I'm going to show you a sample of that. Um, this one I'm gonna, is the service contract approval, uh, uh, what we call the SCAR. And basically, uh, it, it's tied to a database. So all the data that's put in, in there goes to a database and it's captured. Um, it also pre-populates the form uh, with a web service. Uh, so we type in your name, bring your information up. Uh, it also, some forms we have, it'll pull the previous, like for a JNA, a previous contract history from NG uh, for the price history. Mm -hmm. uh, and what it does is it gives you pre-filled information to help you fill out the document correctly the first time. Uh, so if you've never done that before, there's guides in there. Uh, we also have links to captivate videos and some of them and uh, avatar videos that will actually help you uh, understand the thing about it that we like also is that you can see through the routing uh, if it's been uh, returned, uh, changed, or edited. So you can see if does the 
contract specialist or your, uh, the KO needs some additional training, uh, for example, uh, the market research section in a JNA, you know, does that have to be rewritten three or four times? Maybe we need some training on market research. Um, and do you have like a master, master, master dashboard that will show you that kind of thing? Or, you know, like a flashing light comes up and says, you know, next to somebody's name and says, you know, they've had to rewrite their, you know, market research on a JNA four times. So, you know, that person might need some training. Or how, how do you how do you see that? Where do you where do you find that out? Well, we, we can see uh, if, if, if the document's been returned and, and why. And then what we'll do is, I don't want to say anecdotally, but what we do is we don't want to rat anyone out because we want to keep continue with the buy-in. It kind of, right. gives, kind of gives us an idea. Uh, for, like, for, this is just one example. Even in, in the paperless contract file, which I showed earlier, and in the, the assist source selection tool, we can see what they're doing right and we can see what they're doing wrong. And then what we do is we can direct training to address those areas. Um, a lot of the things that you saw in the PMR tool, uh, that I showed you. Some of the questions in the PMR tool are, are to steer people to right behavior. Um, and then what, if we see some bad behavior or something based on kind of what the, the question you proposed, uh, or you posed, is the uh, create an avatar, which uh, I think we're going to show you at the end. Is, mm -hmm. um, and, and I'll go through some of those avatars, the reason, the rationale behind them. Uh, because it wasn't just the contract specialist and the KO. Um, it was also a lot of this had to do with our customers. Uh, our customers not understanding uh, how to do a source selection. Uh, our customers not understanding how to do a fill out a form, why a, a SCAR was important, uh, why a, a PWS, what needs to be in a, PW, a procurement work statement or a SUE or a SAL, uh, you know, and it can go on. And I think everyone is familiar on the phone uh, with their customers and the, the quality of the packages that they're getting or, or how they work with you. And so they, they're, uh, they're being pushed out forms as well, not just the contracting folks, but also the, the yeah, program folks? Yeah, we're beginning folks. to. We're, we're, we're starting some of the, uh, one or two of our PEOs are starting. Or in fact, we have a, one of our PEOs, uh, we have a meeting next week with them, or, or looked at using some of these forms now for for them. And what's neat about this is if they do start using them, it would automatically go into the paperless contract file. So there's no email back and forth. They'll fill it out, it's saved, uh, and it goes back to the contract file. Make it easier for the contract specialist. And well, we for everybody, to, right? I mean, that's that's pretty uh, that's yeah. pretty novel. I mean. <laughs> so here's the like the, the, the JNA uh, that we've been piloting. Uh, we don't really have this fully out, but some folks are playing with it. But it gives you the you can see in the drop downs, this form also can morph into a, a limited source JNA based on what FAR exceptions you're going you're gonna to put in there. So you fill out that, it'll morph to the correct form. So instead of dealing with, uh, you know, three or four different uh, forms, it's all in one based on your questions. Um, and then you can see description of action. It gives, it gives the, uh, the customer, what the KO specialists are helping out, it gives them the policy guidance. It's delivered right there. Um, the dollar thresholds and the, the you know the far sites are all there it's just click 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 an example and then if you need further assistance like for that one the description of action uh, there's an avatar at the top there uh, I think there's about six avatars in this one document uh, that kind of gives uh, a you know a written explanation but the avatar also talks to you if, if you want to get that um, type of train just-in-time training as you're filling out the document so she just pops up automatically, or, or do I have to ask her to come in, or how does yeah, that work? Yeah, just click uh, on the uh, on the uh, yellow carrot that's there. If you see block two there, description of action. If you click mm -hmm. on I, that will give you the drop down inf written information. And if you want to hear the avatar explained to you, you just click on the yellow carrot. And do you find any difference in in uptake when people are are doing that? Uh, whether they they get it better written or 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 when the little uh, cartoon comes on? No, I don't know that. That's a good question, though. Okay. Next slide. So this goes to probably one of your earlier questions. Uh, all that the the form data uh, that's filled in that form transparently can flow to the, goes into business intelligence and then it's pushed up to to dashboards and reports. And this is just a sample. For example, you know, the 
the different FAR exceptions, you know, 302, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and, you know, based on what they filled out in the form, we would capture those, those metrics. And this is just a sample. So it, the power of it is, you know, even with all the other forms, and you can move the data around from one form to the other. So one of the things we've been talking about with the Army leadership is, you know, could, would it be possible to have a capstone document, like an acquisition plan? And within the acquisition plan, have the, you know, the, uh, the, the source selection plan, uh, L&M, you, you know, that would uh, start di moving it around. Instead of having all these different documents, could we do it in one and then based on how you question it? So that's something we're looking into. I'm not sure we're going to get there. That, that's a big cultural change for people. Um, but it really gives you an idea of the power of the technology that's coming out and how it can be applied to our, our, our business space. Yeah, it really does look like the sort of precursor to, uh, you know, throwing Watson in there too or something, some kind of artificial intelligence that really would, you know, start to say, okay, well, so uh, this, exactly is, right. this, is where, this is where we are in our small business numbers right now, our percentage right. and our numbers. And uh, so it'll go out and, and say for your particular contract that you're trying to, figure out right now. Here's all the small businesses that we've worked with in the past on that particular thing or something. I mean, you're not far from that. You really aren't. Well, I mean, it's, you know, we're not there. I don't want to mislead anyone. We're not, we're not completely there yet. I mean, we're, we're, we still have, uh, there, there's, a, I shouldn't say a lot, but there, there's people that want to fight transparency. They don't, you know, a lot of people don't want to say, hey, why, why do you need to know what I'm doing? You know? But if you kind of explain to them that there's, you know, it's good for the whole community. You know, like I described earlier, if if we really have an idea how much work we have, we can make the case to to our leadership and up to the hill why we need this. You know, these number of 1102s to do the work. Um, so we, you know, we every week we have this discussion with people. Um, but I, I think we're getting there because I think the younger folks are really amenable to transparency more so than folks that are my age. Um, and it, it just well, well Matt, I thought you were only about 29, isn't that right? No, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the, the energy that they bring to all this and, and the experience they have with the social media and the, how they welcome transparency is it, just, uh, it just fascinating. So if somebody's asking, and, and, and I was thinking about it too, what are you doing to push this out now to the requirers? Uh, I know you said that some of it's available to them, but uh, apparently uh, not all of it. And I'm just wondering, you know, how much uptake do you want from the requiring activities, and what are you guys doing to, you know, to get there, to get, to get the word out? The other question I had too was, uh, you're talking about people being reluctant uh, sometimes on the transparency thing. Do I have a choice as to whether or not I put my information in here? Well, some of this right now is not mandatory. So it's, it's, it's I would say the customers that are more progressive uh, are, are using it and, and, or want to try it. Um, so it's not mandatory. But the, 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 this answer is going to tie into the first part of your question is that the Army Chief of Staff uh, uh, um, under the new NDAA, National Defense Authorization Act, was given some additional authorities, and he stood up uh, some IPTs, about eight of them, and one of them was to look at Army contracting. And what they did is issued an XORD, uh, an executive order, uh, which is pretty, like, means don't mess around, I'm serious, you have, I want you to do this. And in that XORD, it talks about looking at, having the PEOs look at the life cycle forms and other similar type of technologies to have the requiring activities uh, work to building a standard way of building requirements packages that can be sent to contracting. Uh, they recognize that the reason that it's taken the Army uh, to get equipment to the field uh, in part is due to the, the poor quality of some of the requirements packages that come to contracting. And that contracting has to clean them up. Um, there's some fence tossing. Uh, you know, we'll we'll get it. We'll work with legal. Legal will review it and make comments. We got to send it back to the customer, rewrite it. Comes back to contracting. So this lack of transparency uh, is increasing cycle times, which I understand the chief's concern about. That's just impacting us ability to get supplies and services to our soldiers. Mm -hmm. 
So if we can use this technology, it gives us the transparency, not just in the contracting community, but expand it to that side of the house, uh, we may be able to reduce the cycle times. So right now, the, that XOR was published. Uh, the leadership's reviewing it, um, and uh, we're waiting to get some further guidance about this being assigned maybe to a program executive office to, to, to maybe champion this um, for, for that effort. So this uh, slide that you've got up here right now is kind of perfect for this point in our, our discussion, right? Yeah, so the, the, the source selection tool uh, basically um, it helps us with the, the trade-offs in LPTA. Basically, it makes you uh, uh, follow the process. Uh, it like, and especially helps us with customers that have never done a trade-off or best value. Um, it walks them through the process, and um, it provides some training videos. It, for example, it'll it'll help explain to an SSA what the role is and why it's a serious position and why you need to take your your uh, responsibilities seriously. Um, no, that's the source selection uh, evaluation team, right? Yeah, the tool, mm -hmm. the, the source selection tool. I'm just going to talk on that briefly. Uh, but the, um, the the neat thing about that, if it comes to a hard stop, like for you know before you issue your Ians, uh, you know, have you made a competitive range determination? And, and if folks are short on schedule and they try to circumvent the process. You know, we'll lose a protest. I think everybody knows that. If you deviate from your plan, you're going to lose. Uh, so it kind of makes you stick to your plan and and try to help you avoid the pressures of schedule uh, so you do the source selection correctly. And here's a, the avatars, uh, just the, the uh, last, not, last but not least, uh, um, we came across this concept, like you mentioned uh, earlier, and uh, in an article from the medical community. Um, the medical devices that they sent to hospitals, uh, they, give them a, they were giving them a manual how to use the device. And when they tested them, which is kind of scary, 50% uh, of the nurses and doctors passed the test. <laughs> and, uh, and what were they using? Is this some kind of a new scalpel or something? You're making me nervous here. They, well, this, the one, the article, uh, if anyone's interested, was about a thermometer. Uh, uh, oh, boy. <laughs> so, uh, so, it's, so what they did is they decided to use, try something different. Instead of the manuals, have a quick avatar uh, that walk, would walk them through how to use the medical device. Uh, and the people, they got 90 to 100 percent people passed the test after that. Wow. That's, so that's, we, we looked at that and said, well, you know, I, I wonder if we could apply that to contracting because we kind of knew that, uh, go back to the younger, the under 55 crowd, we're, we're not <laughs> really reading the 300-page the, uh, source selection guide uh, and, uh, you know, the kids were, you know, they liked the social media. So we said, you know, what are some of the things that we're seeing? Uh, that are problems in our space. What are we seeing in VCE that's a challenge? What are we seeing in the assist source selection tool? And, um, you know, uh, can, can we build avatars that would help them? You know, and one of the things, you know, at the bottom left there was really sitting down with the customer and, and trying to explain to them about, you know, selecting the right evaluation factors, the, the right criteria, you know, what, what's important to you. Um, how can we make it simple that's something they would do and they would get interested in? And it's like a 20-minute avatar. Um, we saw, for example, at the top there, IGCEs. We saw poor IGCEs. We have a smart form for IGCEs that's being tested, uh, but also an avatar on how to do an IGCE. Um, and then below that uh, post-award conference, what we were seeing is poor post-award contract admin. And why mm -hmm. was that happening? Uh, we have a contract admin division in the Army, and they look at they strict they just look at post award contracting. You know, they the oversight for that. And what they found out was that uh, during their review, that uh, the the teams that were after the contract award were, were not having a post award conference. You know, I mean, they may have a small one, but they weren't bringing all the players. So this avatar is for the the con basically for the team to understand. You know, hey, you need to have everybody in. Uh, you should have a kickoff meeting so everyone understands their responsibilities at DCMA, the KO, the customer, uh, 
possibly DFAS, you know, th things like that. Um, and the core, presumably. Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and uh, I think we have about 14 or 15 of these now. Uh, we're doing one on protest that I think will be published in the next week. Um, you know, basically source selection 101. Um, and um, it's been pretty positive. It's real simple. They're up on YouTube. And like you said, um, I think there was an OFPP got wind of it, and they, they published them up to FAI uh, for folks uh, to take a look at. So what's the uptake? Do you know? I mean, how much of these things get watched? Who's watching them? Have you really been able to tell that it's, you know, it trends younger and that sort of thing? Yeah, I would say it definitely trends younger. I, I think uh, um, it trends a lot younger. We're, 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 they're on YouTube. We can see the counts on YouTube. Uh, um, I think our customers like it because they can go in and see something, get an under, a quick understanding of what, what the KO is talking about. What, what does the KO mean about evaluation factors? You know, opposed to where, hey, I'm a PM or, I, I, you know, opposed to work conference. What, you know, I, I, I heard what it was. I may have taken a class about it, but, um, wow, this tells me, you know, this is something I need to do if I want to have a, a, a successful program or a successful product delivered uh, service. And like you said, the COR is the Quality Assurance Surveillance Plan there on the bottom is, is a screenshot. I think we're going to show that uh, if we have a few minutes. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll be quiet. Um, uh, you know, we can see, you know, we have CORs. Uh, they do the monthly status report, like we all know. But, you know, what is really in the content of that status report? You know, what, what is, the, you know, the Quality Assurance Surveillance Plan? What, what, what is the responsibility of that? And, and why is it important? Uh, because it is important. And plus, as, you know, all the KOs on here know that, you know, we all get audited. You know, we, do we have our COR documentation? Do we have a COR appointed? Are we getting the monthly report? You know, is the, is the cost? Uh, you know, so this helps us um, do our job and helps us get a better um, product. So let me ask you, I know that the Army's got a lot of things going on, particularly around service, uh, services acquisition. Uh, as does DOD. I mean, you know, for the first time in the long history of contracting uh, in these last few years, services have outpaced everything else. And uh, and there's just a lot of it going on. And one of the things I think that both at the DOD level and the Army level that people have discovered is that there are a lot of people uh, out at bases and in different facilities and out, as you were talking in the field and whatnot who are doing stuff to, that's, that's essentially contracting stuff who may or may not have gotten much in the way of training. Uh, to do that stuff. Uh, so there's that going on. And, and then uh, just in general, services uh, contracting has been, you know, let's, let's be honest, it's been kind of a challenge for folks. And so I know the Army is out doing, I think, for both Army and maybe even some of the other services now, the uh, SAW, the, the Services Acquisition Workshops, where they're going out and kind of SWAT teaming even um, with with folks who are working on a, uh, a a services buy and stuff, do you have a particular set of stuff that speaks to to the whole services world? I, I, well, we have an office in the Army that oversees that entire uh, project. It's currently run by a, a gentleman, my former boss, Jason Deco, mm -hmm. um, and, and they are uh, overseeing the metrics and actually looking at the things that you just described, and you know, looking at. Uh, commonality across everything, you know, by PSC codes and and um, getting that oversight uh, in play. Um, as far as the training goes, yeah, there, you know, there's a, a, an abundance of training. Um, even with these avatars, um, the Army folks can go into TEDs and get CLP points. I think same, I think FA, FAI is doing the same thing. So, you know, you could go in and, uh, you know, the, for the, the class and get one CLP point, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and it's an easy, it's, a, it, it's probably the easiest CLP I ever got, you know. So. <laughs> now, is there a test? Yes, there's a quiz, uh, there's a quiz, uh, you know, uh, that even I could pass. So, uh, <laughs> I don't think anyone would have a problem uh, with that. But uh, I'm not sure what FAI did as far as that regard goes. But uh, for the Army folks, uh, uh, it's tied to TED. Now, uh, as, I, uh, as I recall, there was a... A casting call that you guys put out, right? I mean, these different avatars are, are based on on people. Is that true? Yes, 
Yeah, these are, uh, in some of them, it's like uh, with the old Alfred Hitchcock, if you have to see if you can find them in the movie type right. of thing. So uh, they, they uh, the kids build these things, and they try to see if I could, I've caught about 80% of them. So, uh, so in other words, they're meant to look like somebody, right? Yes. Who really yeah. exists. Now, but who's voicing them? Uh, we have a couple. Uh, we have uh, one, uh, about uh, five people. Um, uh, for the Captivate, we have a Adam Rothschild. That the, the folks across the army call him the Voice. Uh, he's got a good voice. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so we're very big on diversity. Uh, the army contract community is very diverse. Um, so we uh, we're very. Uh, it's a very makes us more powerful. Um, gives us a lot of uh, positive input. So. Um, you'll see that in the avatars, a reflection, really, of, of our demographics of our organization. Yeah, I've noticed that uh, that they are quite diverse, uh, even to the point of including uh, talking helicopters and radars. <laughs> yeah, there's a couple other things there if you find them, but I'm not going to mention them on this VAO. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, well, I haven't got a bunch more questions uh, uh, myself, and I'm I'm not seeing a lot coming in. I think maybe we've overwhelmed folks with the with the massiveness of this. The one the one thing I do want to know about is is are other parts of government coming in to see what you're doing here and and whether they can adopt this. I mean, we really shouldn't be in the business of recreating the, you know, reinventing the wheel here. You guys have something that you're obviously uh, that's already robust and that you're building out more and more. Have you gotten inquiries from elsewhere? Are are other services or, or civilian agencies or, or, or starting to, to, to follow in your footsteps or even see if they could beg, borrow, or buy this thing? Um, well, we, there's been a few. I, I, the, the challenge for us is that the, the Army's, uh, we're going to the next generation contract writing, writing system or um, Army contract writing system. So all the functionality that you see here are, are requirements of, of, of that. So we're, we're going to migrate um, to that system probably in about, uh, uh, 2022, 20, 24. So folks have come in and asked, could they go in and, and use it? Um, we say, well, if you're in there, what do we do with your data once we migrate? Um, we, we have given the code out to folks um, that want to use it. I know we've given it to, <clears throat> uh, to a few folks uh, that stamp their own. The, the issue with the challenge for us, though, is it's, it's you know, the, you have to come back to us really at find out to help us set it up, even though we gave you the code. The code's free. This is all government-owned, except mm -hmm. for the licenses for Adobe and SAP business objects. It's all Java. Uh, it's an Oracle backend. So the, the government owned this. Um, we have given it out in the early versions with uh, some, like the State Department. We've worked some with Department of Energy uh, because in the beginning of it, uh, contractors were coming in and asking for the code, and we found out what they were doing is they were trying to go around and maybe sell it. And our general mm, at the time mm -hmm. said, hey, you know what? The, the taxpayer paid for, for this once. It shouldn't be paying for it twice. And I think there was a, uh, after that, there was a law even written that, that uh, by the Congress that said if uh, the government, if one agency paid for it, it should be free to the others. We shouldn't have to pay for it twice. But, but you know, since we're in a sunset mode, we're, we're really not uh, uh, really taking anyone new on because we're not sure what we would do with their data once we shut down, if that makes any sense. Mm hmm Interesting. So, and you're not actually an IT, you know, sales shop either. But um, I, so I'm assuming that you can't do a whole ton, ton of support if you were to provide it for other people, right? No. Uh, yeah. We're. Uh, uh, what's unique about our office, though, is that with the Ganser Commission, is uh, <clears throat> uh, they, they they wanted to try an experiment where the 1102s would manage the project. Uh, one of the the gripes was that systems that were being delivered were coming from contractors and IT people, and they weren't really tuned to what the 1102 KO contract specialist. So uh, it was a bit of a battle when it first got stood up. It, it was actually it had to be settled at a four-star level, but they, the, the uh, General Dunwoody was their name, uh, said, you know what, let's try this. Let's have 1102s, let's have a KO manage each of these projects, let the technical team work under them, uh, and let's see if we get buy-in. Let's see. Let that. Let them be the voice. Let. Let's. You know. See. And 
and you know we're we're still around, <laughs> so maybe it's worth it. I guess so. So let's uh, let just for kicks, let's uh, let's show a little snippet of uh, of one of these things. We're going to have the caption closed captioning on it, but uh, it's still uh, it's still fun to to, to take a, a few minutes look. So we're going to just take a look at it for about three minutes and and then come back in. Jose, do you have any additional questions regarding documents that need to be included in your acquisition requirements package? Yes, I do, Michael. As you mentioned, there needs to be a Quality Assurance Surveillance Plan, or QASP, included in the package. Would you mind taking a moment and providing an explanation of what requirement directs us to create a QASP and what is required to be included in the document. Certainly. If you wouldn't mind, I'm going to request another member of my team to join us in this conversation in the conference room. Her name is Beverly, and she is a quality assurance specialist. But before I do, let me summarize the answers to your questions before Beverly goes into the details with you. A QASP is the government's plan outlining how it will ensure the contractor meets contract requirements and ensure the contractor maintains quality control. The Federal Acquisition Regulation documents the requirements of the QASP. You see, at the end of the contract, the government must accept or reject the contractor's performance and certify contractor's invoice for payment. Quality Assurance Oversight provides the basis for acceptance and payment or rejection. The QASP outlines the plan for government quality assurance oversight. A plan is necessary to ensure the oversight is effective. Oh, I see. The QASP is a plan to oversee the contractor to ensure we get what we pay for and ensure the contract is meeting our needs. Exactly. And as with any plan, a QASP should contain the five W's, who, what, where, when, and why, and should also contain the how. With regard to a QASP, those five W's are translated to what will be inspected, when it will be inspected, who will inspect, where inspections will take place, why inspections are needed and how the inspections will be conducted. The why is answered by identifying risk level and the how is answered by determining the method of surveillance. Give me one moment while... I'll... Hi everybody, so thank you all again for joining with us today and uh, Matt, this has been terrific. Uh, we. Uh, we really are appreciative of having the opportunity to be able to, uh, to to see what you guys are up to and also have a little fun with us today. Wish you the best going forward and hope you'll come back uh, in, in a bit and talk to us some more about uh, what you've done with the new contract, what, when you have the new contract writing system and also with some of the stuff that you're just starting to introduce right now. Uh, be fascinated to hear uh, how things have developed and, uh, and changed as a result of, uh, of the work that you're doing. Uh, thanks so much, and I uh, enjoyed the opportunity uh, to do this, and I uh, sincerely hope that uh, it has been uh, useful for the members of our audience. And again, thanks a lot. No problem, and thank you. And now I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to Shana, actually, who's going to uh, explain uh, the CLP process and finish our, our uh, webinar out. So thank you all very much for joining us today. Hi there. If anyone has any remaining questions about anything covered today, please go ahead and enter it in the Q&A section on that right-hand side of your screen. 
Um, additionally, in about 15 minutes, you'll receive an email with a link to your certificate, as well as the presentation and the playback of today's webinar. So you'll need to log into VAO and navigate to the My CLPs page, and that's where you'll find a verification quiz, which will be on the right side of the screen. You'll check the box certifying that you attended the webinar, and your CLP certificate will appear on the screen and will also be saved to your transcript on the VAO. If you run into any problems, please reach out to our customer care team at customercare at asigovt.com. So when you close um, your screen at the end of the presentation, you'll first see a pop-up inviting you to share feedback about today's webinar. We'd love to hear any suggestions you have for future webinar topics and your input matters as we plan our presentation. So don't forget, we'll be sending you an email in about 15 minutes with links to today's presentation and your CLP certificate to make sure you have everything on hand. Thanks again so much for joining us today, and have a great afternoon.